That's how we're going to start the podcast because we are recording now. As you can see, it's been hard to kind of communicate with old Roger. He's speaking, uh, is that is that the language they speak in Texas? In Arabic. It's Arabic? <laughs> yeah, I don't know it's that. It's in the air and it's Bic. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I forget that you've dealt with uh, young adults your whole life. Yes, it seems, it seems like it. I uh, <laughs> have been a professor at three different universities, and, and I love teaching the undergraduates as well as the graduate students. Cool. Now, for those just joining in, Roger Gold, entomologists. A real, a real live, live one. Entomologist. Not just the guy at the fly shop. So, yeah, the... Uh, the duns are coming off. The, the no. blue duns. What's a really hard Latin name I could say to sound impressive? The hydropsyche were coming off, guys. They're a little bit lighter color this time than last time. So it's real important that you match the hatch. Yeah, you, you asked me one time what entomologists thought of the people who were showing the Latin, yes. Latin names around. Well, we feel sorry for them <laughs> because they really need to spend more time tying better flies, which are small. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. So... Your Latin impresses nobody, okay? Your Latin impresses nobody, unless you're taking a test. Well, you need to retain all of those things and hope you don't flush your mind before the final. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. exactly. Speaking of final, the last podcast, we had overwhelming demand to bring Roger back. So? And this isn't the final episode. This could no, be no. Week, many to come. But. This is the, the, the second step of a friendship. Right, we're gonna ha we're gonna make you come back time and time again, Roger. I, I can't afford to come in the store anymore. <laughs> <laughs> see, this is also a marketing effort. Um, oh, I see. You okay. come in, Roger always tries to hit right around a hundred bucks. <laughs> I I do, and that's it's hard to <laughs> keep it up to, under that. <laughs> Rod, if Roger's wife is listening, that was a joke. A uh, hundred bucks is just a term for ten dollars. Do you think she'll believe it? No. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> but I never ask for a receipt. So that's so, true. So who Smart knows? Man. Smart man. Well, we have. Um, th is this going to be like a toy unboxing? It it, or? it can be, Cheech. It depends on if we can hold your attention. Well, see, <laughs> that's a big if. But what we're going to talk about when when Roger left last time. Um, we were chatting uh, downstairs in the shop, and he said, I want to talk about metamorphosis. Very direct-like. Seems like it's a fairly important thing, right? Well, it's, it's critical uh, to understand uh, how the insects grow and develop. Okay. And sometimes uh, we say, well, we can't catch anything. The fish aren't feeding. Well, there are many reasons for that. They've fed already or they're in, in their metamorphic stages, meaning that their gut has just been shed and, and it must be very painful. And it goes for quite a few days when they can't eat. Fish and, can't eat. Well, they can't eat because mm -hmm. their stomach, I'm sure, is very, very sore from having the exoskeleton which lines the stomach is actually ripped out during the molting process. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Well, I didn't design it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger, you never know. You never know. How often would you say that happens with fish? Well, with, with the insects, it happens on a, on a regular basis yeah. each time they molt. So in between molts, uh, the, the fish are not that hungry. Uh, we, you know, it's called anthropomorphism, where we try to put human characteristics on something that's inanimate. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. oh, like here's the one that I like the most. So you imagine that a fish has been eating the appetizer all day. You know, the the zebra <laughs> midge, and here comes along a cheeseburger, the chubby Chernobyl on top. That fish is going to see that, and it's just going to want to eat it. Have you heard that one before? Yeah, I have, and uh, I'm not sure what that means. That's Neither do I. pretty deep for an entomologist to fish with cheeseburgers. Because I, I can relate <laughs> a lot of things to cheeseburgers. Apparently. So, like, exactly. I'm not going to lie. I may have may or may not have tied that fly that he was showing me. But anyway, I digress. 
anthropomorphization of fish. Yeah. Did I say that right? I I think you did well. What language was that? Ah, eso no sé. Solo hablo español. (laughs) Sí. Okay. All right. I won't derail too much, but I can't sit quiet. Anyway, keep, like, where were we at? Well, we were talking about the lining of the stomach, and then there are times where they don't eat. Uh, Yes. Uh, What we were talking about, and we will continue to discuss, is the molting process, which is one of the miracles of um, nature. Uh, We don't think about all of the hormones and and so forth that are involved in the development of insects. I mean, we think of those in larger animals and human beings, but the insects themselves have a very intricate balance of hormones that makes a difference on when they're going to molt. They will not be active. They will not be feeding during those periods of time. If all of the eggs are laid uh, from a female, um, and then that becomes what is called a cohort, meaning they're all the same age. If they're following the molting process, all of the offspring of that female that were laid that day basically will not be feeding at, at, at all through each of the instars. It's something that has been studied, and it's just uh, an amazing part of yeah, the biology. That's crazy. So you talk about hormones. So what what does uh, like how does it all start, or what's what's the? I mean, how do we get into this as it relates to to fly fishing? Well, in fly fishing, obviously, we use different f- different phases of the development. Of mm-hmm. if you're a nymph fisherman, uh, then you're using immatures. If you are a dry fly fisherman, then basically you're, re- you're dealing with the adult phases. And the adults are made up of, of, in most of the million different species of insects, the, adult, uh, the, the populations are made up of males and females. The, the males are oftentimes referred to as being drones. Drones. A, a drone is, uh, basically means that all they do is mate, provide the sperm or fertilization methodology, and basically they die. It's the female that carries on when she lays her eggs, and in some cases she'll mate again, again being inseminated, and another batch will be laid. But all of the eggs that are laid at a given time are going to go through the same processes because everything in, in what are called cold-blooded animals is determined by temperature. So if the water is colder than it was yesterday, things slow down uh, because there's not enough energy for the insect to heat itself and to complete the processes. That that's, that's a big point, right? Especially this year, Roger, where we had a really long winter. Yes. You know, up on the, the Snake River where I worked most of the summer, all the hatches seem to be super delayed. And is that temperature related then, or are there other things as well? Well, well there, there are a lot of, of clues uh, that, uh, that the insects use when, during the mating and molding processes. Temperature is probably the most important mm-hmm. because it's obvious, even as warm-blooded animals, human beings, that when we're cold, we are less active. We're not as adept as that we would be normally. This, is e- this happens even worse with cold-blooded animals that are dependent on the temperature. They're not expending energy to stay warm. They just try to move around. So they're moving to where it's warm and not that interested in feeding as they would be if it were just slightly warmer. Hmm. That's interesting. Like, And um, so what is the feed? So we're talking insects feeding. Would you say that that relates to the fishing aspect of it? Because as they feed, that's where they they become more vulnerable or what's the, the relationship there? If it's, if it's extremely cold, the, the main thing is slow down everything you do. If you're, as a fly fisherman, 
you reel slower, you cast shorter, and you make it easier for them to catch up because they are not going to expend the energy to go get that, that fly or that piece of food. This is mm -hmm. the way they look at it. And do insects do the same thing where they'll slow down and... They have to because yeah. they don't have the energy. They can move out to the current mm -hmm. and they can't position themselves as well. And so they're going to be moved downstream. Ah, okay, yeah. So though, these are a lot of factors now. Yeah. On a because the fish is affected independently. Well, the fish are also cold-blooded. Right, that's yeah. what I mean. And, is that and, and so they everything react, is slowing react. down. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of a double okay. whammy. Right. Now, it's even more difficult to explain in, in terms of there are different insects that have different temperature ranges that they prefer. That's not surprising. I, again, I'll keep bringing it up that the entomologists have determined that insects make up 80% of all of the animals on planet Earth. And they are the most abundant, even though a lot of them are small. And they are basically everywhere on the planet. And that's not true of any other animal, including human beings. Yeah, yeah. Not quite adapted to as wide a range they of aren't. conditions. They aren't. I love that point, and so let's just take a minute with it. Yeah, that's... Okay, here's something to ponder. That insects, uh, because they have very short uh, reproductive cycles in, in terms of uh, that it, an insect, uh, a fly, uh, just a general house fly, can go through in a generation in seven to ten days. For a human being to go through a generation, uh, looking at the world population of, of uh, the first children in, uh, in the world are, are born to women that are between 14 and 16 years old worldwide. So a generation time of 12 years for the discussion point is very different than seven days it is the point. So insects can adapt to changes in the environment very, very quickly. And in laboratory settings, we literally can select for characteristics that we want or that, that we're interested in studying. And you can do it quickly, and that's why we use specific groups of insects. Like, you've all heard of fruit flies are used in genetics, and again, they have a very short reproductive time associated with it that's that's crazy and i think that everybody knows well these these insects definitely you know reproduce a lot faster than us but that's that's a crazy fast um you know what do you call it, generation time exactly uh they again uh just the insects are amazing and I didn't start out to be an entomologist, but I fell in love with the scientist, uh, with the science of, of associated with the insects in, in graduate school. Changed entirely what I was going to do, mm -hmm. and uh, I worked with leafhoppers, which again are amazing, because they are vectors of plant diseases, uh, from peach trees to corn to grapes and and so forth. Now that has nothing to do with fly fishing, but what it has to do, it just points out again that uh, you, selection by nature for survival is what it's all about when it comes to all the animals and plants. Hmm, yeah. So when we're trying to throw like chartreuse wings on our comparadons to make them easier to see, it'll make it easier for us, but the fish isn't gonna be very impressed by that because, you know, they're very, dialed in. Well, until the insects, yeah. because they reproduce so yeah. quickly, can imitate that chartreuse, yeah. and they'll come out with chartreuse yeah, wings. Exactly. Well, right. <laughs> to, to, to say that uh, they wouldn't be impressed is being a little more anthropomorphic. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I love that word, because it just kind of rolls off, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if it's a bad day, just say, well, I think maybe you were a little over anthropomorphic on these fish. They're, <laughs> just keep in mind yeah. that fish are not really very smart. <laughs> I always tell people when they check out, I say, just remember that all the flies are guaranteed to work as long as you find fish dumb enough to eat it. 
Well, right? uh, good for you. You're right on. I know. That's the first time. That is. It <laughs> <laughs> is the first time. Oh, my word. I get it from all, from all angles now, even Roger. Um, now, what was I? I had a thought. It just totally blanked. Well, that's a little unusual, too. So <laughs> let me jump in here yeah, and let's, let's start the discussion that I really wanted to have. Okay, we're waiting. Because, uh, all, right. like, it, it all, all I can provide here is interrupting you and asking you questions well, about and Roger. Well, that, I enjoy that, actually. I'd rather talk about the things that you like. <laughs> no. But, but I like to talk about the things that I prepared for. Let's do it. And, and that is that in, I'm going to give you what is called the obvious approach. Okay. With insects, the vast majority of insects, the female, lays eggs. The egg itself is, is actually very complex. They have a, sh a shell on them or a covering uh, that protects the embryo that's inside of the egg. It's called embryo development in, in the egg itself. When the, egg, when the embryo within the, the egg membrane that's on the outside, when it has completely developed, it's got to escape from the chorion, it's called, and to make it into the into the environment. And again, it, there are so many different ways that happen. Some of them have a point on their head, they bang into the membrane. Others of them eat the, uh, drink in the ambiotic fluid and they stretch and break it open. But the point being is it starts with the the first instar of the insect coming out of the shell of the egg. Now, those very small insects, if the fish can see them, th that's a smorgasbord that's going on. And usually, if it's warm enough that one group of insects are going through the development period, there'll be several others. The, the, f the quickest of the ones that normally we work with are the diptera, which are the, the midges and, and some, the flies and so forth. That happens very rapidly. And so when we are sampling in the rivers, which is something we need to talk about another time, is that among the most uh, diverse and the most numbers are diptera, the chironomids and other flies and midges and, as uh, uh, some people call them there well the, the, each of these terms we use have a different significance yeah. in terms of the science but the the point i'm trying to make is some of these insects uh, reproduce so rapidly they can take over a part of the environment and it's called the niche and i think we talked about this before a niche is where an organism can make its living. And so it's got to have food, water, and air, and others of the same species to survive in that niche. Anytime those things come together, the insects are going to, are going to grow and the populations will increase. What that was a long explanation for, if you caught a fish somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> go back and fish that again on another day because the niche is occupied. Everything they need to survive is there. But keep in mind that that population is going to mature and it's going to emerge as adults and they will leave that niche to, to go to other areas for the females to lay her eggs. That was really a long explanation but it re the point is, if, if there's an area that has been productive for you, go back. And if there's nothing within a little while, move on. They'll, they'll be somewhere close. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think that, you know, we talked about this a little bit last time, but, you know, if you were really going to, you know, use a seine properly, you would do a seine sample every single time you move stream, you know? Right. Like, how, how good, like every 50 feet up it's going to be maybe even a different situation right well that's what or we what would you that's say? what we do as part of the the science that we're working with here in, in utah is that we will sample 
like 10 sites uh, from one f from uh, the Deer Creek up all the way to the Jordanelle, which is 13 miles. And we'll only sample 10 sites, but we'll use the same sites time after time yeah. because we want to see how things change with the time of the year, mm. uh, the speed of the water. Th this last year, uh, particularly this last winter and then into the spring, we had the highest flow rates of the river that we've had in years. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we are sampling now and trying to determine how much of the population of the insects has been pushed downstream. Mm, because but, of the high But in flows. general, just in general, the majority of the insects are going to move with the water downstream. Hmm. And then uh, when they go through the reproductive processes, hopefully the wind is going to blow the right direction and the, <laughs> the, <laughs> so uh, the adults are going to be going to use the wind to get back up to the head of the stream. And again, those are things that entomologists and weird people study. <laughs> weird people. And, and I am just amazed at how things have evolved and, and how these things work. When in doubt, like there's scuds at the, at the top of the middle provo. Scuds don't have wings. How did they get there? So the answer is, just always blame the birds. Just always <laughs> blame the birds. Hey, here's, here's a topic. I was actually commenting on a Facebook chain, and we're in the dog days of summer, so we talked about how cool water and, and the cold temperatures can affect everything. But on the other side of it, let's say like, you know, dog days of summer when the, when the water gets really warm, like above 70, what does that do to the bugs and the fish? Okay. When, the, when they're stressed. Because one guy was saying, oh, no, you can totally fish it. There's a study, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't hurt the fish. So well, what are your thoughts? Well, we're talking fish versus the insects. Yeah, like both uh, sides uh, okay, of it. Okay, well, yeah. both sides. Let's start with the insects. Yes. Side. The, the warmer it gets, there's going to be some speed in, speeding up with the development. Uh -huh. But the worst part of high temperature is the loss of oxygen out of the water. Mm -hmm. The warmer it is, the less oxygen the water can hold. So if it's very hot, go to the areas of the stream where there's more of a ripple or where there's an opportunity for the water to be aerated. And so the hotter get in the, in the area that there's, the, the, it, there's more swivels and, and, and so forth, more movement. Okay, when it gets colder, it, it's, uh, again, they're gonna slow down again. Uh, but you need to kind of learn your stream. How's, how's that? Mm -hmm. In other words, when it's hot, you'll fish a little differently than you will when it's the normal yeah. cold. Because the idea is like, you know, when it's, when it's too hot to fish, the fish are stressed anyway, you're building up lactic acid, it's bad for the fish for them to be more stressed than they normally are. And all of that is true. Okay. And some of the states now are restricting fishing when the temperatures get up in the high 60s or into the yeah, 70s. Yeah, in the 70s, yeah. Because the fish will die, even if you're very careful with it them. It swam because. off just fine. Well, yeah, it'll swim off just fine, but... To its grave. Yeah, it's going to die. <laughs> well, and, and we, the fish are just too pretty mm -hmm. and too important to only catch one. Once. Yes. Once, yeah. And... Yeah. and and I, now that we have worked with these different parameters, it's a true statement. And so be careful when it's very, very warm. Yeah. Because the oxygen is in, in low, low concentrations. Yeah. You can still catch fish, yeah. but just handle and that's, them very yeah, that's carefully. A, yeah, and that's the thing is like it's, it's not the question. Yeah, you'll catch fish for sure. The fish will eat. But it's what happens afterward. That was the argument this morning. I'm well, but what saying. does it do to the metamorphosis? So let, let, let's say, a, um, I mean, you name it, the, a caddis hatch. If the water is exceptionally warm, what does that do to the caddis me metamorphosis from, say, their larva to pupa? And, okay, uh, a hatch is the completion of the metamorphic cycle. And so if it's warm, it's going to favor 
that they're going to come off. They may want to come off. See, I got anthropomorphic there. They they don't think <laughs> they don't about, want to. They're they don't think they just they just do. Yeah, but uh, it'll be in the cooler parts uh, of the day. They do not survive well under extreme heat. These little tiny, uh, very fl fragile insects mm. that are emerging yeah. from the water, which is uh, that's where they do their best. The emergence is the the most dangerous time for an insect. Yeah. The safest time is when it's on the bottom of the stream attached to a rock. Anything from that point, when they have completed their development, they've, in, in terms of the insects that have a, uh, what's called a pupa stage, like caddis you were talking about, yeah. the, the da most dangerous time is when they come out of the pupal case and begin the migration through the water and get up to the surface where they then emerge. They're sitting ducks. Now see, we've got into a whole different thing. Those yeah. are those. Well, and that's the thing is this, this metamorphosis conversation spurs so many different ideas that I think a lot of us don't think about as fishermen. So we just want to catch fish. But there's a lot of, you know, you know, more than just it's going to mess up the fish when it's hot. There's a lot no. more that goes into that. Well, well, there is. The food supply is, mm -hmm. is, uh, is it's affected by the temperatures, by, by the weighting that, that you go through. Uh, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. You know, there's some states now that are saying that when you're weighting if, and you disturb the bottom, that you will, on purpose, you will be fined. Mm -hmm. And the reason, again, is in the heat of the summer to get all of those insects that are, you know, pushed downstream by the water, that really is changing that environment for more than, than just the fish, but the, just for all of the other animals that are there. So the San Juan River is where I have seen that. In, yeah. that it's been enforced. The and, San Juan Shuffle. And if you do the San Juan Shuffle, then they will stop you and you can be fined. And it's not just because of unethical fishing practices, which it is. It's because it screws up the it, aquatic life. It does. There's a cost to that environment because of that, you know, the disturbance and the distribution of the food resource. Yeah, that's a good point, a good way to look at it. I think people only usually look at, well, is it legal because it's considered chumming or whatever, but it goes right. well beyond that. It's it, Well, know. it does, but that's another subject we should, and I'm gonna, yeah. I'd like to kind of talk about this at least briefly. The, the question is, does the river heal? In, the, in other words, if you disturb the bottom, like we do when we take samples, so we asked some students to take on a project to take a, a one meter, which is about three square feet, and we'll disturb the bottom and then we'll go back through time and sample carefully in there and see how long it takes for the insects awesome. yeah. to, to reestablish and to get up to the population they were before that we did the you know the disturbance well it's amazing if if the water is warm enough that it's favoring growth and it's not being disturbed by rain and snow and, and so forth within a few months it's it's back and so this whole That's idea cool. is is if we're careful it will heal and that will come back and support the insects which in turn support the fish population that's that's awesome but yeah. if you think about it i would say you know if we're talking the insects and the disturbance if we're talking months then on a given piece of the river you, you could have somebody stepping into that zone every day right. so it would seem then logically the insects on really highly trafficked rivers where people are walking in them would suffer kind of longer term Th they do but the suffering is is uh, is going to be where where it was disturbed. Right downstream, you've got a lot of food that's moved downstream, and so the, again, so we started off by saying, 
downstream is right. is where the majority lesson learned of the don't fish up by the dam fish you go at down, utah lake you go down to utah lake uh, well uh, <laughs> no <laughs> okay <laughs> there's a smelter that used to be on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no that that's super interesting because i think that you know we go in and we're like oh just get a sow bug and a zebra midge that catches fish all the time but you know and this also explains why you know, Euro nymphing with a really good presentation, just the bug right in front of the fish, is going to be effective because, like, it just kind of looks like a little bit of everything. But that bug's more in the right place at the right time than being the right fly for the right. Right. The the other way to look at it is is that when we're fishing, we are one part of a very intricate population of yeah. of animals, including the insects. And yeah. so you need to make sure that they can feel it or sense it and that it will stand out a little bit from the other population. Now, they, fish are binge feeders. Uh, if you've watched the fish, and we all have, but you'll see them go along and they'll go on their side and, and they'll hit the bottom. And some people will say, well, they, they have parasites and it itches. <laughs> well, that can happen, and so I'm not going to say that's not true. But what they're doing is they're disturbing the bottom like we would if we were walking there. And then the insects are in turn going to raise up and start to move downstream. The fish will circle down and <laughs> just open their mouth and, and just take Chomp. them in. Yeah. Now that is particularly true of nymphing. Now dry flies, which is the real art form in, in my <laughs> opinion, you're dealing with the, uh, the mature insects that have completed their development on the bottom of the stream or in the stream, and they're making their way to the surface where they then emerge uh, to mate and to, to lay their eggs. And so we don't say that things are smarter in, in this, this, <laughs> that world, yeah. but they, have, they are at high risk when they leave the bottom and make their way through the water column. Hmm. So cool. at a high level, I mean, looking at our props here, um, it, is that something you wanted to go through, like the metamorphic stages or keep it more high level? I, mean, okay. I think most fly fishermen kind of know how that works, but I don't know. Okay, there are several kinds of metamorphosis uh, based on the, the molting cycle that, that takes place. In what we call is uh, simple metamorphosis, those that go through a simple metamorphosis that there are three stages in the life cycle. There's the egg that is absolutely in, incredibly important. That the embryo completes the development and then it emerges and then it begins to molt on a cycle. And that is determined by hormones that come out of the brain or other organs that are in the body. And there's a particular hormone, there's a molting hormone, ecdiasis. And then we have a juvenile hormone, and I'll try to explain that to you. But in an example is a scud. Yes. Is a, it's really an old kind of a group of, of insects, or excuse me, of arthropods. They're not insects at all. But the point being is, when they molt, they look basically the same. And they just, just get bigger. they just get a little bigger. On others, like uh, this is a, a cockroach, but there are a, a lot of of insects that again that go through molts, meaning the the entire exoskeleton, including the lining of the stomach, comes apart and they move away from it. I, I just can't imagine how painful <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> th th that would be. 
but that's anthropomorphic. Yeah. You know, I, we don't know that <laughs> How they have Maybe pain. they're just like, oh, I can't stand this. Uh, yeah, like I, you got oh, that of, feels so good. Uh, okay. I can't relate, but like when people buy pants that are too small and they don't fit, you know, I, I bet that's really uncomfortable. So well, like and, and that's part of the process clothes. of metamorphosis. See, there you and go. And so as they have grown, then they're, they get tight. Their exoskeleton is, uh, again, one of the marvels of, of oh, yeah. nature. The exoskeleton provides protection for the insects, and it's very effective, but it limits growth. And so the insect has got to get rid of the exoskeleton, and it will split open, and they'll climb out. And then the first time they come out of the exoskeleton is, or out of the egg, excuse me, the, the chorion of the egg is called the first instar. Mm -hmm. An instar is an immature insect. Mm -hmm. The next time it molts, it will be a second instar and, and go all the way up. There are some insects that molt 10 or 20 wow. times uh, or some other organisms related to insects that are ashrapots. The average number of molts and, and averages that just don't mean a whole lot in, in terms yeah. of science, but the average is about five molts. And so five times in their life cycle, they're down, meaning that they are going through a molt, they don't eat, they don't move around very much, they're unprotected, okay? When, they, when the new exoskeleton begins to harden, it's called tanning. They go from an off-white to the color, the natural brown color in the case of this insect. Okay, then they do that five times. Each time they do that, they are vulnerable is the point. Yeah. I, I continue to be amazed we have any of these. Because they they're, out, they're really the, bright the, colored when they, when they molt, right? Well, they're different colored. Okay. But they go from white to browns yeah. or blacks and so forth. Okay, so the average number of molts is around five. It can be more or less. Okay. The molting then is critical to their development. The, the whole idea on insects is to, is to become an adult and to mate, provide additional populations in that environment. And as long as they can complete these cycles, they'll be an important part of that environment. And, and again, we need to keep this in perspective. Okay, we, we then go to a whole other group of, in, of insects. And in terms of these insects, things like beetles, and butterflies, and, and uh, several other orders they're called. They have a more complex metamorphosis. They have a new stage that was just a miracle that this was selected for, called a pupa stage. And so you have something like a caterpillar, and then they go into a pupa stage where the exoskeleton hardens up I mean, it isn't even pliable, and it acts as a covering. And these, these insects that are in the pupa stage essentially are not feeding. Uh, they're very, just almost not breathing. I mean, they are really in suspended animation. When, when the pupa stage has been completed, and it's genetically timed, meaning they have to be at a certain number of days mm -hmm. at a given temperature, and those are things entomologists play with, particularly in crops. Mm. Okay, when the pupa stage has been completed, then there's a one more molt, and that is the adult comes out. And this is called complete metamorphosis, means it has changed completely in, in terms of forms. This is the reproductive in, in the case of complete metamorphosis. And a butterfly, if you think about, you know, it's an ugly worm and then it becomes quiescent as a pupa and then emerges something that 
and many times in, in, in the world of taxonomy, taxonomists have made a mistake and called the immature stage one species or one group and the adults is another because they are so different. Mm -hmm. Now, how in the world that this very complex metamorphosis came about? In the next life, that's one of the questions I'm going <laughs> yeah, to ask. Like, there, there's that question is how did we get this complex metamorphosis? The other one is who designed the shoulder? Because yeah. this, okay. is, this is the weakest, this, Roger. and yeah. I've had my shoulders redone so many times. And Curtis is even in the, the yeah, wimpy the shoulder club. club. This, this summer, I just located yeah, my shoulder. You know, it's just because I get these bursts of stupidity Yeah, <laughs> that I'll be fly fishing and fall down. He and can make this dude that can live his whole life in the bottom of a river, and he can't make a human shoulder. Can't make a shoulder. Well, I'm not going to go there yeah, well, any, we, anymore yeah, because I got a lot of other questions that are going to be asked of me. So. <laughs> um, yeah, this this is awesome. I mean, um, I think that everybody knows that there's like the hatch and there's you know nymphs and there's dries, um, but like if you spent like 20, 30 minutes just researching the bugs that are in your river, you'd probably learn some stuff that would change the way you presented your bugs, I think. Right, and, and we oftentimes recommend to people that they take a sample. Uh, again, that's disturbing the bottom, and so be careful about the laws uh, on that watershed and so forth before you do anything in terms of disturbing the bottom. So let me ask you this, in a, the instars, let's say stoneflies, Right, go through however many? About five. Five. Um, in the course of, uh, on average, a year, maybe sometimes three? Well, it depends on, you know, the this, family yeah. and so forth. Some of them are, are one year, some of them are three or four right. years. In, in general, the bigger the insect, the longer it takes for development. Mm. So in a fly fishing application, would it not make sense to target instar colors? Yes, uh, I, I think it makes sense to basically try to match the hatch. Uh, and actually, I love that phrase because it makes people think more about what what the insects look yeah. like and, and how they behave and, yeah. and, and so forth. Uh, at, at the same time, they've got to the insects have got to see and respond. To the food unless they're just opening their mouth which they do when they're really hungry and they'll take in everything like a vacuum cleaner uh, just some things that that i dream about or worry about don't have to worry because <laughs> it's not that important but when you have caddis flies which we have in the middle provo here we have a, a lot of species of caddis here, more than we would have ever have thought. But, but basically, the fish eat all of that. Right. In other words, they go along, disturb the bottom, and they eat everything from those that are emerging all the way down to those that are still in the rock case. Mm -hmm. and, and so they've got to digest that food and get rid of the rocks. Talk about painful, Yeah, I, I think. I, you know, again, we don't know about pain. But uh, it, no, it's, uh, it's, again, an adaptation. If you want to catch fish, you, it's worth your time to learn about what they eat. And uh, they, the majority of, of the fish in rivers and streams are eating aquatic insects. They're high in protein. They have roughage and they have a great deal of diversity. The other thing that, that I am continually amazed at, some of them come off early in the year, and some of them come off middle of the year, and some of them come off just before it freezes up. Mm -hmm. And so there's a diversity, and it's that diversity that keeps our fishery working. And, and so if you wanna be thankful for anything, be, be thankful for that we live uh, where, where things evolve, they get better. And as human beings, we need to learn to get better. Oh, yes. as, as a fisherman, <laughs> let's be conservationists, not, not just taking the fish out. 
Mm -hmm. I, I don't mind, you know, taking fish and eating them, but let's understand that there is a lot of complexity involved and be, be appreciative to it. Yeah. And you don't have to be an entomologist to really be thankful for the things we have. Yeah, yeah. That, that's great. I mean, uh, end with a, the, a positive note, like always with you, Roger. Um, Let's see. I think we might have to do another one of these. Yeah, we too. may. I would say <laughs> drop a comment below yeah. on any topics or like we could probably have a whole thing on instars. Instars. Yeah, or we could just say or talk about caddis or you know what we could talk about individual orders. Uh, yeah. We could even just oh, open like it up series. and we could create a series called Ask Roger. There we go. So drop your that. comments, questions there you go. for oh. the insect. Okay. I, I just experts. I just hope I do Down not below sounds naughty <laughs> no or, or Roger, talking down no, to people no, no. or that i'm boring them no yeah. every everybody like they would much rather have you talk to them than us <laughs> well, tell you that right now based okay. on the last comments so we really appreciate you coming yeah, by roger sure. um, oh no i i love to be in your shop obviously i'm here frequently trying to convince my wife that we're talking science. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. This is science. This is a science. Well, it, it is, <laughs> and it's something that I appreciate so much. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's fun. I mean, I mean, it, it is. I, it, to me, it's uh, part of my religion because yeah. uh, we are so blessed to have these kinds of things that make our life more diverse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's and, a really good and, way to yeah, think. We, and we don't we don't start killing everything. I mean, that's <laughs> another thing. Yeah, I'll kill deer that are eating my trees. <laughs> <laughs> my wife has named them all. That's Hoppy, and that's and I that's have a hoppy. name for him too. Yeah, that's, that's called backstrap. Back <laughs> <laughs> okay, when you cook him up, invite me over. <laughs> all right. Well, that's how we ended this one, guys. But thanks for watching. Very good. Shoot some questions over. There will um, be more. But these are always fun. I always learn a lot. Okay. And I'm no better an angler because of it, because uh, I'm just hard-headed. Well, we all, we all just continue to do things that work. <laughs> all right. But I'll tell you what, it is so fun. And I'm sure you have done it, but if you haven't, let's do it sometime. Okay. I'll take you down and we'll sample and show you the diversity. And, and uh, the diversity. Sounds like a video. A stream video. Brigham will have to come it, it, too. Is that all right? Yes. And no, that's, that's absolutely we'll all right. We'll make sure he doesn't talk though. Like, no, just that's what does, Where is he He'll from? He'll stay behind the scenes. He's, he's from Rexburg. Oh, that's so, okay. Yeah, it's, it's just say, hey, Brigham, those, potatoes are over here. You know, we moved here from Texas and we're still y'all. Y'all? <laughs> yeah. Fix and tune. We're, we're going to carry you over the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> oh, huh. Can you go eat at Whataburger? Yeah, Whataburger. <laughs> all right. Are we still recording? Yeah, we're. Yeah. no, this is all part of it, Roger. Uh, all thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we're out. We got him. See ya.